Hi, I'm Warren Haig and welcome to a brand new series of interviews with former Red Rose stars. To kick us off, I'm delighted to be joined by a player who played 56 test matches, 45 one-day internationals and three 20 internationals for the team down under, Australia, the enemy really, but he's one of us. Played for Lancashire, 2010 and 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, can I introduce you to Simon Cattage? Cat, how are you doing, mate? I'm very good, thanks, Hedy. Pleasure to be here and uh, nice to be chatting to you. Oh, mate, it's, it's great to talk to you. And we, you know, we've had some, some, some great players on this uh, on these, these series of interviews we've done and, and it's great to have you along. Fresh from a bit of a rest now. You've been, a, you've been at the IDL um, with the RCB Royal Challenges Bangalore and uh, you're putting your feet up now. Yeah, we had, uh, I think it was probably about 10 weeks in the UAE there for the IPL, which was a little bit different this year. Uh, normally it's in April, May in India. And whilst it was a bit different, it was still a fantastic tournament. Um, there weren't crowds, obviously, but... Um, the quality of the cricket was excellent and I think um, the way that the, the tournament panned out for us in particular, you know, whilst we were disappointed with the way the tournament sort of petered out in the end, uh, we felt that we'd made some strides on previous years, getting to the playoffs for the first time since 2016 and, and seeing a number of our young players, um, you know, have, have big campaigns really and uh, none more so than our young opener. Um, Padikar, who made the most runs by a, a young player on day, in his debut season, the IPL, I think just under 500. So there were some good signs from a few of our youngsters. But um, yeah, unfortunately, on the back end of that IPL, I had to do two weeks quarantine in Perth um, to finish off that stint. So it was a long haul, uh, but certainly very enjoyable and, and great to be a part of RCB for the first time. And whilst, uh, yeah, whilst we were disappointed to miss out on um, getting past the Eliminator, um, hopefully it'll keep everyone hungry for, for next season. Fantastic. And we'll touch a little bit more on that uh, a little bit later on, Kat, because I think all, all our viewers are really interested and, and have been kept alive by the IPL with the lack of cricket in the, in the country. But, you know, let, let's, let's talk about your, uh, your time with Lancashire. You had two spells. You were with us 2010, 2013. Um, and although you weren't there with us for a long time, you, you know, you left a, a real good impression with both players and the supporters and members at Lancashire, Lancashire Cricket. What are your memories of those times, Kat? Well, I was very fortunate. I did play for a number of counties, but um, my first recollections of Old Trafford was way back in 2000, my first trip to, Australia, uh, to England, uh, playing for Durham. And I was only a kid really then. I'd only played maybe a season or two for, for WA. I was still pretty inexperienced. And it was a huge eye-opener, particularly batting at, at uh, the Riverside. Um, but then I got an opportunity to play at Old Trafford early in the season. I think, first of all, in the B&H, the old B&H uh, competition, yeah. uh, which right. I think was a quarter final, which I think you guys were too strong for us on that occasion. But um, also got to play a, a championship match there and I'll never forget playing against you and John Crawley and even Chappie. He was playing, Peter Martin, um, Gary Keady and, and even Yatesy was playing as well. So as a youngster, it was a fantastic challenge for me. And, and a man that I got to know a lot more later on in my career, but didn't realise at the time, Bob Simpson was your coach. So, um, and Bob helped me out later on in my career um, with a few things. So that first recollection of Old Trafford was there was an absolutely beautiful wicket to bat on. Uh, I managed to get 100, which was, you know, something that was really special to me being a young kid in England for the first time. And, um, and then to get an opportunity to come back and play for Lancashire, which, you know, is it... A, club that's got a huge uh, history and tradition and you know some of the all-time greats of the game have played there as overseas you know guys like Clive Lloyd and um, Wazim Akram and these sorts of guys I've probably failed to mention a few others as well but um, you know to walk through you know the history of all that through the corridors and be a part of it in 2010 uh, when Peter Moores invited me uh, to the club uh, and predominantly it was just to play some T20s which was interesting because I'm not really or wasn't really a T20 player, but um, there was a role there for me to play in the middle overs against spin and I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and then to come back in 2013 uh, and play the full season, uh, which ended up being my final ever season of first class cricket, um, you know, it was really special because I sort of knew at the start of that season it probably would be my last um, because we were due to have our second boy uh, in 2014. And, um, 
no, I couldn't have known that at the time, actually, but we were planning on having another child, I should say. <laughs> so I had a feeling that it might be my last season in England, given that if we were going to have another one, um, it would be hard to be away from home with you know a newborn and, a, and another youngster there. So 2013 brings back a lot of fond memories because we did win uh, Division 2 of the champion, County Championship after the boys had been relegated. Um, and to play with, obviously, current coach, Glenn Chappell, he was amazing. Um, Ashwell Prince was still playing. Um, Paul Horton, Crofty was still playing. Uh, Kyle Hogg had a magnificent season. Yeah. Uh, young Simon Kerrigan was doing really well and was on the verge of playing for England. Um, so there was a lot of really good young players there. And um, to be there as a senior player and be a part of that season was really special to get the boys back up and, and back into the Division 1. Absolutely, and you 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 mentioned that that team uh, that that management team of, of Morsey and Chappie who who were there at the main. Glenn, Glenn Chappie was a, was a very successful captain for Lancashire. Guy that come through the ranks, he was he was one of our own. But as he was like a he was like a fine Australian red one. He got better and better and better as time goes on. And you know you know what, Cat? He still bowls in the nets now, and he's still one of our most accurate and, and nippiest bowlers. Albeit only for about eight or nine balls now, but uh, I wouldn't tell him that to his face. <laughs> well, but, go on. It doesn't surprise me to hear that because I know in that season in 2013, he was still right up there with the best bowlers in the competition. I know we had Jimmy Anderson, who's obviously a legend of England cricket, play with us at the start of that season and he bowled magnificently. But Chappie was right there in the same sort of class, um, particularly in the first two or three games of that season when, when Jimmy played for us. And the thing that I always found amazing about Chappie, having played against him as a, an opponent, but then also playing with him, was that, you know, I was surprised he didn't play more for England. And I guess it's um, a byproduct of, of how strong that team was at certain periods when he was playing throughout his career, because his county record was magnificent. Um, you knew what you were always going to get from him. He was always in the contest, bowled good pace, bowled a heavy ball, and, and you know, did something with it as well. So... Um, you know, between him and, and Morsey, I didn't really touch on before, but um, I'm really surprised he didn't get to coach more at English, at England level and international level because what I saw of him in those two seasons in 2010 and 2013, he was superb. I've certainly learned, learned a lot about him um, from that experience now for me and my own coaching career and um, the way he managed the group and, and pretty much got the best out of everyone. Um, that was something that stood out and, and he made it a lot of fun. Um, both seasons were a lot of fun, but they also, what stood out to me was his energy and his passion for it. You know, he just loved talking cricket. He was always up for it day in, day out. And his messaging to me was always spot on day in, day out. And that to me is probably the, the key to coaching in a way is to, to trust the players and to allow them the freedom to play how they want to play as a unit. Um, but also make sure that you need to pull them into line when, there's, there's the right occasion has to be um, the right thing has to be said or or then let them go at the right occasion and, and let them the freedom to make up their own decisions and between him and Chappie you know the two of them uh, did a fantastic job in those seasons that I was there and I really I loved both seasons I wish I'd been younger and been able to play more cricket at Old Trafford because I what stood out for me was the way the boys played their cricket it was very Australian it was very aggressive um, they loved being in the contest. They didn't mind a chirp. And I loved all that. Um, they, they went about it in the right way. But they also, you know, they were all also, you know, good after the game, having a celebration together and having a beer together. And that real unity stood out to me. And um, the thing that I remember the most is that song, the Lancashire theme song where the boys play it. I think it's to the music of Chase the Sun. I might be wrong with that, that dance music. I'm a bit old for the dance music these days, but... Um, that song just made my day every time the boys started jumping up and down and singing in the rooms. <laughs> that, that's brilliant. And you, you mentioned Moores and you mentioned Chappie, and Chappie's been similar to you. He had a, he had a fantastic career uh, in the first class game and has got on to coaching. I think he's taken that that experience that that, that you said that, that Morsey brought in about the players bouncing into the dressing room in the morning, enjoying cricket. And that's what it's all about. Because we're all, all at the end of the day, we, we all started in the same place. We all started playing for our club size. We, we live for, for um, Tuesday, Thursday night training sessions. And we live for the game on Saturday. And, and Morsey, it seemed from, from looking from a business point of view, in the dressing room, the players were, were bouncing to that uh, in dressing room. And, that, and, that's, and Chappie's brought that on to his coaching style now. Yeah, and that's, that's something that I think we all 
um, can easily forget in professional cricket is that it can become a goal for everyone to really want something badly and you forget about the real reason you played it as a kid. And I think, you know, the more you can bring that back to the group as a coach, you know, the more that you can get that real youthful enthusiasm out of the group because ultimately that's why we play the game. And it is a brutal game at the professional level because everyone wants to do well and, and not every day goes according to plan both individually and from a team point of view. And, and that's why you need the leadership, whether it's the captain and the coach together, you know, driving and steering the ship in the right direction, particularly with the attitude, because at the end of the day, everyone that gets to that level can all play the game. There's no doubt they've got the ability to play it. It's just the ones that obviously go on to achieve success as individuals and teams probably want it a bit more and work hard and, and deal with the setbacks better than anyone um, to go up, go again when things haven't quite gone to plan. And that's something that I thought, you know, the pair of them did beautifully in those couple of years that I was involved. 2000, 2013, you, you came back, like you said, and you played all formats of the game for, for the Red Rose. And, and you were extremely successful, Cat, as well. You mentioned batting at Old Trafford uh, and where you originally started your, your, um, your, your cricket at, at the Wacker in Western Australia. Was there any similarities with that? Well, in terms of comparing Australian conditions to England, it's always hard because the wickets probably are a little bit different in terms of the way they're, the consistency of the pace and bounce and then the movement through the air in England's different to that in Australia, given the, the conditions and everything. But the one thing I found about Old Trafford, and there's probably only a couple of grounds in England that have that pace and bounce, like some of the Australian wickets, and, and Old Trafford was one of them. It, it felt like the balls came onto the bat um, particularly the first experience I had, as I said, for Durham, it felt like the ball came on nicely and it's a quick outfield. Um, but what I did notice was the ball spun, even from day one. And that was the, the recollection I have was of, you know, there being some footmarks and, and guys like Gary Keating firing it into the rough and trying to get something to spin out of there to us left-handers. So it, it did have a little bit of a difference to the whacker in terms of the amount of spin it took earlier in the ma match, particularly four-day cricket. Um, but I, I found that the pace and bounce was as close to what you'd get in Perth for an English wicket. And so that's where um, I think, yeah, I had that real love for batting there. And then even when it changed direction and I came back in 2013 and it swung around facing, uh, I'm not sure which direction it is now, whether it's north, east, west, south. Or north, south. Yeah, so um, I still found it to be an amazing wicket to bat on. Um, in all formats, and in, and in particular, sometimes in the T20s, it took some turn, um, which I think is great for the game because it, it sort of challenges guys to be able to have some craft in the middle overs when the field spreads, to be able to you know manipulate the field and, and hit twos and fours um, because it's a big ground without just having a power game, yeah. um, which is what you guys can get away with a bit in T20 these days with small grounds and flat wickets. So... To me, I found it a really good all-purpose or all-format um, wicket um, where it tests everyone and everyone's in the game. Batsmen love batting there. The quicks enjoy a bit of pace and bounce with the new ball and then the spinners are in the game uh, as well. What about, you know, Kat, you've played all over the world. You've played in the IPL and the Big Bash. You've, you've played for your country. But did you, um, did you experience the... the uh the certain things that go on during a, a Lancashire Roses game against the old enemy Yorkshire, did you? What, what do you think of those games? Well, it's funny because I did play in, uh, in the T20 format of that, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, 2013. Mm -hmm. And I love, obviously, that the banter is, you can hear everything that's being said in the outer, particularly at Headingley. And obviously, the Lancashire supporters dish it out beautifully at Old Trafford as well. And I think the beauty about county cricket, and that's where I think a lot of us that played in that sort of era of, of county cricket uh, from Australia, you know, we felt like it gave us a, an amazing education and experience in terms of our own games, but also from a team point of view, being able to experience the atmosphere of playing in those big games, whether they're broadcast on Sky or, or whether there's just a packed house at Old Trafford or Headingley. So, you know, to be a part of that, um, particularly as a younger player, um, you know, I was, I was probably a bit older at the back end of my career when I experienced it, but it didn't matter. To me, it's just that buzz of playing the game in front of people that are passionate about the game and passionate about their team. And so um, I got a huge thrill out of playing in those Roses matches and I loved how passionate the boys got when they knew the Yorkies were coming up. <laughs>
<laughs> There's no, nothing like a Rosie's game, Kat. And you, you mentioned passion, and you mentioned you mentioned that 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 feeling in yourself uh, as a passion and Australian. But you know, you reached the uh, you reached the pinnacle of your career when when you made your Test debut. You know, it's like a, every Englishman, every, every Australian, any any country that plays cricket, really. The, the passion of those players is to reach the top level and, and play cricket for your country. You know, wearing the three lions of England or wearing the green green baggy of Australia in 2001, that came uh, that came true for you. Yeah, look, as everyone says, it's a it's a huge um, thrill when you get that moment of being presented your baggy green or, or whatever country you represent. And um, I think the reason it's so special, like everyone says, is that you know the journey you've been on from a kid to then making it become a reality. And I think for me, you know, what made it so special was um, the fact that a tradition got brought in not long before my debut. I think it was in about 1999. And Steve War as captain brought in the tradition of a former player presenting the baggy green cap to a debutant. And where I was blessed was that I had the great Richie Benno present me mine at Headingley in 2001. And so you know, that just made it even more special because in Australia and in, in world cricket, he was an icon, an absolute legend, not only for his playing career as captain of Australia, but also as a broadcaster and, and you know, how well he was uh, thought of around the world. But I guess what made it even more special was that, you know, I had family and friends that had come all the way over from Australia from it, uh, for it. I had a couple of mates that I went to school with that promised me they'd be there for my debut if I ever made it for Australia. Really? which was special. Um, and they only found out a few days before. So it was a huge effort for them to come and um, join me and my family. But I think on top of that, Richie said, there are many more important things in life than a baggy green cap. But to an Australian cricketer, it is the ultimate achievement every time you wear it with pride and enjoy yourself. And I think that made it even more special because of you know the wisdom of the great Richie and, and the fact that all my teammates were there uh, being a part of it. That, that's amazing. That, that, that is an amazing story. And, and like you say, Kat, you had a great career first class. You had a great career in international. But then we move, they move on. It comes to us all. We, uh, we, we hang up our, uh, we hang up our, our boots and, and, and we do something else. And, you know, you've stayed in the game and you've been extremely successful as a coach. Was it in your mind as a player that you wanted to stay in cricket? No, that last season in Lancashire, when I sort of thought it might be my final season um, in first class cricket, because we, we were planning on having another son uh, or another child, I should say, not another son, but we end up having another son. <laughs> um, that next, I had one more season of Big Bash to sort of, I wanted to, we'd, we'd had two missed attempts, the first couple of BBLs uh, missing out on winning the finals and then got to the third one and we finally cracked it. So I thought that was the perfect time to go. And then, Early that year, I think it was in sort of uh, February 2014 was when I finally um, made the decision to finish up. And then my, my second son, Leo, was born in August 2014. And I went straight from playing the BBL final on a Friday night in Perth to then starting full-time work at one of the AFL clubs in Sydney, which was a new team, on the Monday morning uh, in a role that was setting up a leadership program and then learning about football operations manager role. So... I got out of cricket for a couple of years, absolutely loved it. Um, but then a few things happened that sort of led me back into cricket a couple of years later. And uh, one of those was, um, you know, working in the IPL. And the other one was doing a little bit of work for the um, broadcasting tests here in Australia during the summer. So with young kids and, and the busyness of the role at the, the footy club at the Giants, I felt the time was right to probably get back into cricket and have that little bit more flexibility with the kids, but also get back into something that I've always loved and, um, and and not miss an opportunity that I thought, you know, you just never know where those opportunities will ever present again. So when it came to work with KKR uh, as an assistant coach, um, it was a fantastic opportunity. Um, and yeah, managed to have four years there before the opportunity came up with RCB. So um, yeah, it, when I was playing, I actually, I used to think about it when I was captaining and thought, I reckon I'd struggle as a coach because it feels like you can't um, you can't have an influence on the game compared to when you're a player. And I always thought, I wonder how I'd cope with that if I was a coach. And then when I first started coaching, it's obviously a little bit easier when you're assistant because all the responsibility is on the head coach and you're there to support and, and learn and help. And I learned that over time, once you do become a head coach and it's on you, I realised that, you know, the biggest thing... 
um, I've tried to remember from that whole experience as a player was to try and trust the players as much as possible. So that's one of the things I sort of wrote down before I started coaching was what I wanted to sort of believe in and stand for. And, and one of them was to really trust the players because it's their time. I was lucky enough to have my time as a player. Um, and whilst you do like to guide them in a direction you think is appropriate, you also want them to be able to make their own decisions to learn and experience things for themselves in their own careers. So um, it has been hard at times, but I've also felt like I've been, able, been true to that and haven't imposed myself too much um, to the groups I've worked with and um, allowed them that freedom. Kat, tell us about the tell us about what it's like in a you know because there's lots of people who be listening to this who watch the IPL the, you know the, the 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 buzz of it the noise the excitement the world class players tell what's it like to to be around an IPL um, season yeah, yeah look it's exciting I think the beauty of it from a coaching point of view is you know that in a short space of time you've got a, ch- a chance to achieve something so you know obviously in county cricket or international cricket sometimes it can take you you know 12 months to two years to get to somewhere that you want to be to be successful whereas in IPL because of the way the salary cap is and the way the auction works and the chance to rejig teams from year to year every time you start an IPL tournament everyone feels like they're a chance to compete and potentially win a title and when you think you can do that in the space of eight weeks um, it's exciting because it's something's up for grabs so that's that's the beauty of that I guess the the hard part is you don't have a lot of time as a coaching group to try and bring everyone together from all different backgrounds and cultures to try and have the ultimate success of the team. And sometimes because there is so much money involved and there's, you know, so much is at stake from an individual's point of view, um, you know, whether it's auctions or contracts or all that sort of stuff, you can understand that guys can be there potentially just making sure that they do well for themselves. And from a coaching point of view, the hard part is to try and get guys playing for each other in the team. So that's the biggest challenge at times. But, um, you know, by having senior players around and, and guys that have been there and, and done it for a long time, the experienced players can obviously help um, set that, you know, you know that uh, foundation for the, the team. And we were v- very lucky this year to have a lot of senior players that um, I asked to try and mentor a lot of our younger players. And a lot of the boys bought into that. And they did a fantastic job of passing on their knowledge to a lot of our younger players that were experiencing IPL for the first time. And that was something that really stood out for me that a lot of our senior boys, like your Coleys and your De Villiers and your Finches, your Staines, your Morrises, they were all there to be able to impart their wisdom on some of our younger players. And, and some of them were young Indian players. Um, and they really benefited from having that experience um, and, and you know, knowledge to be able to ask questions and, and, and do that. I think I think you 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 probably agree that some of the some of the best teams that you've played in both in Australia and all around the world um, the best teams are, are the teams that that trust in each other as players and everyone knows what their role is and some days he doesn't come off you know you've got a guy at the top who wants to come out and blast it may nick off early but there's a trust there in the players that they know what their roles were and that that benefits them doesn't it it certainly does and I think Look, looking back at my own career, the thing that I'm probably the most proud of throughout it, and yes, it's nice to play for Australia and all of that, but I think what I think back on now when I catch up with mates and past you know, teammates from whichever teams I played for is being part of successful teams. And that's what I love most about coaching now is to try and be able to replicate that at the teams I work with because um, we're all competitors. We all love the contest. That's why we play the game. And and now from a coaching perspective, that's the one thing I like to try and impart that, you know, groups come together and ultimately, yeah, you can do well individually, but the thing that gives you the greatest satisfaction when you look back at the end of your career is all the winning teams you're a part of and the success you have with your teammates and the fun you have celebrating with your teammates because you all know how much time and effort and hard work goes into winning titles. And that's something that, you know, really drives me now with the coaching side of things. Yeah, brilliant. And, and, and look at me now. I like the celebration part I'm far too much at the moment because it's that nice and easy. <laughs> but Kat, we, um, we, talk about, uh, we talk about future and some exciting, exciting games to come and it's exciting initiatives to come and not, not so much the, uh, the 100 next year. You know, unfortunately, due to, to COVID, we weren't able to have the 100. But head coach of the, the Manchester Originals back at Emirates Old Trafford, it's going to be, it's going to be a, an exciting time. Oh, it certainly will be. It was a shame it got postponed this year, but it was the right decision. 
given that it's a game that's going to be trying to target a new audience uh, and potentially bring more families and kids to the game. You know, the concept of it all is going to be different to T20. You know, there, there are some intricacies to it with bowlers being able to potentially bowl, you know, 10 ball over um, and target a certain batsman, you know, potentially if they come to the crease. Obviously, you know, 20 balls less in the innings. It's going to be interesting to see how that affects, you know, batsmen and the pressure they're under to score quickly right from the word go. So there will be some, you know, differences in the game. But ultimately, um, you know, being able to start something from scratch. I remember when T20 started in 2003 in England and how much it's grown since then. So it will be exciting. And to think that, you know, a lot of the best players in the world wanted to be a part of it last year. Hopefully the FTP will allow a lot of them to be involved in 2021 and we'll find out more in the next couple of months. But, um, you know, I feel very privileged to be given the opportunity to come back to Old Trafford and um, basically, yeah, start things off, you know, in the 100 and, and see how we can go. So it is exciting. Obviously, a lot of those guys I mentioned before, you know, Chappie's part of our coaching structure, which is great. Um, and, and I think the beauty is, Hopefully, we'll be able to get, um, you know, some really good crowds to the game and play an attacking style of cricket that, you know, people like to watch. And hopefully, we've got a home ground advantage. That was part of, you know, when we put a group together last year, albeit it's a, a lot, you know, a long way out from when it actually starts now. You know, we did look at having as many spin options as we possibly could, given the nature of Old Trafford and the timing of, of the tournament being in July and August. And hopefully, we are playing on something that spins. So um, time will tell, but we'll see uh, see what happens. Oh, can't, we can't we can't wait for we can't wait for 2021 to see cricket all all over the globe. Hopefully, getting back. But you know what, mate? It's been been great to catch up with. It's been great to listen to to your memories of, of Lancashire cricket. And of course, Emirates Old Trafford with your old teammates. We really appreciate uh, you coming on to uh, to kick these series off. It's, it's always great to see you. You, you know, you know, as a player uh, and a coach, you'll you'll always be welcome at Lancashire Cricket, and you'll uh, you'll always hold that special place in our members' hearts. Uh, but Simon Cattage, thank you very much for joining us. Good luck. Get your feet up. Enjoy that Australian sun while it's absolutely throwing it down outside here in uh, in, in Manchester, uh, and we look forward to catching up with you soon. My pleasure, Heggy. I was always made to feel very welcome at Old Trafford. And it's certainly uh, when I think back on my career and the fact that I finished it at um, Old Trafford in 2013, my first class career, um, it, was, it was something very special to me. So um, I just wish I'd, as I said before, I wish I got to play a little bit more there, but that's the way it goes. And um, But I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity and, uh, yeah, look forward to catching up in 2021.